you're extremely welcome to the partnership plenary event, uh, a partnership event between the US and Europe, the Atlantic, a shared resource. My name is Peter Heffernan, and I have the honor of being the chairman for this afternoon's event. Um, for any of you who don't know our speakers, we have a world-class team of scientists, policy leaders from both sides of the Atlantic, uh, people who can make a difference, people who are leaders, uh, and people who I think have a lot of important things to share with us. The format for this afternoon will be four keynote addresses, followed by four five-minute contributions from our four other distinguished panelists, and then we're going to have a roundtable open discussion, and we will facilitate uh, a Q&A from the audience as well. Our first address today will be titled, What Once Divided, Now Unites, and I'm in tremendously indebted uh, and appreciative to Professor Scott Glenn, who has at short notice stepped up to the plate, as one would say in America, uh, to fill in for our dear friend and colleague, John Delaney, who due to illness uh, was unable to make this trip, but I'm glad to report to you that he's recovering well, and he's with us here in spir spirit. Um, Professor Glenn has had a distinguished career um, in oceanography, uh, has and operates a technologically advanced ocean obser observation and forecasting network. Uh, he's a principal investigator for the Integrated Ocean Observing System in the US, uh, a tremendously exciting development. And Scott is going to give us a talk, what once divided, now unites. Scott. Thank you, Peter. Uh, the title of this talk, with Once Divided, Now Unites, is to talk about the longest river. Uh, the longest river continues the theme that we began last night. Uh, the longest river event uh, was a combination of science, uh, poetry, and music. Uh, today will be science and poetry. I will not sing. Okay. Uh, this is a joint talk between Professor John Delaney and myself. Uh, I was with John when uh, he found that he would not be coming here, and we decided to combine our talks into one, and that's what you'll see today. John always starts off with poetry, and so we'll start off with poetry again. It'll be the same poem that we started and ended with last time, with We Shall Not Cease From Exploration. And the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started. So today we've arrived here, and we're starting where we left off last night uh, to explore the longest river. Here's a picture of the longest river, an artist view of what that river should look like. We have the, what's called the ocean conveyor belt. And we say the longest river because, right, the circumference of the earth is like 40,000 kilometers and there's there's the Amazon a very small river in comparison and so the warm the red is the warm currents as you see flowing north taking the solar energy that we collect at the equator moving it north in the North Atlantic towards Europe and then we see the blue bottom currents the colder currents recirculating and so this is that longest river that conveyor belt that connects all of us we want to look first at some of the history, some of the people that have looked at this in the past. And we'll start with the first map of this region. And that was produced back in 1786 by Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin was the postmaster uh, in the US, postmaster general. He was worried about ships that were traveling from, in, uh, from Europe to New England or Virginia. And he noticed that they were getting quicker to New England than Virginia, and they wanted to know why. And they asked the whalers. And the whaler says, there's something out there called the Gulf Stream, this current here. And we can tell it. We can see it with our eyes. It's a different color. It's a very blue. And we can feel it with our hands. It's warm. We can put a bucket and put the thermometer in that bucket and see that it's warm. And we still use those techniques today. The satellite revolution in the 1980s looks at the sea surface temperature, looks at the color of that ocean with sensors in space, and gives us maps very much like this. 
200 years later, we produced the first forecast models of what this Gulf Stream does. And so it's taken us that long till we get to the place where we can observe something, understand it, and produce a model that forecasts it by the mathematicians. If we move on a little bit farther in history, we look at the first successful transatlantic oceanic telegraph cables that connected Canada with Ireland. Here's that copper cable. It was used to communicate. It cut the time of communication from weeks to minutes. You could immediately communicate with Europe. That was a big advance. 140 years later, we started using the same kind of concepts, those cables, buried subsea to observe the ocean. And we'll talk more about how we continue to do that today. The third event, now that we could communicate, we wanted to explore. And this is the first global exploration, the HMS Challenger mission, launched from England in the 1870s. The question of that day was the debate over evolution. And to, to settle that debate, we went out to see, to, to see if we could discover those answers. And on the way, we discovered other things. One of the big things that they discovered was that in the middle of the Atlantic, there was a mid-Atlantic ridge. And we'll talk more about that today. And so sometimes these discoveries aren't planned, but there's something that occur on the way. So from this global view, from this global exploration uh, of our Earth system, we move up to today. Back then, the date, the debate was over evolution. The same debate now is going on on global warming. If you, if you uh, Google climate change debate, you will see that Jim Hansen was just in Edinburgh receiving an award, and he said that we are losing the debate to the public. That was yesterday's news. And the debate that we are losing is about this system here. This is the Earth system as it's viewed from space. When you look at it from here, you see the, the land. You see the atmosphere, the swirling and the structure of the atmosphere. But you see a blue ocean that's kind of constant. It doesn't, doesn't look like it's even moving. And you certainly don't see the bottom of the ocean. So you're missing that whole piece of the globe, which we know is like three quarters of the Earth. And so the challenge that we have right now is to, in this system, for humankind, to optimize the benefits and mitigate the risks of living on this planet. And that planet is driven by two main energy sources. One of those energy sources is the internal energy of the Earth from when it was formed and compacted. And that internal energy produces molten rock below, way below the surface that upwells towards the surface in places like that mid-Atlantic ridge discovered by the Challenger. At that mid-Atlantic ridge, that molten rock comes to the surface. It makes new crust. It pushes the old crust away. That crust is where sediment accumulates and at the edges of those plates where they collide. That's where the great mountain chains are built and that's where the great ocean trenches are built. So this is the process that's going on internally. It's that movement of the, ge of the rock, of the geology, that's going on based on the internal heat of the Earth. This is the map it produces. This is the map that John looks at every day to figure out, you know, what are these processes? Can we forecast? Can we predict? And here are those plates. Here's that mid-Atlantic ridge, the longest continuous mountain range. This is where the crust is formed. And so, as you can see, in this video that's running in real time over the last 280 million years, you can see the continents spreading apart. Um, this, this, this ocean here is maybe 130 million years old. Human uh, Homo sapiens have been on Earth for 
200,000. So we're just a blink in the eye of this Atlantic Ocean. So that's the picture that John will look at. This spreading of the plates, this separation between us of the Atlantic. The other energy source is the sun. It's what's driving the atmosphere. And we see those swirls. And what we want to look at now is the unseen swirls of those oceans. What does that ocean look like? And for that, we need the help of mathematicians. And when the mathematicians get together and put together those numerical models of what that ocean circulation, we see that it, too, is quite complicated. And here, we see those pieces of the conveyor belt, that longest river. But it looks nothing like that artist's rendition of those nice, smooth curves that run from one continent to another, that, run from, uh, that bring the warm water from the south to the north. We see swirls and eddies and filaments. And it's this structure that I go to see to study. And so that's why John and I have been working together for so long. His interest in that basin that contains this longest river and my interest in the river itself. So what we'll do next Why is that river important? If we look at the complexity of that river, we'll see that it will vary over years and years. And here, we have time clicking off over about a decade, so month after month. And we look at the anomalies in the sea surface temperature. How does it change? Where is it cold and warm? And then we look at the land, the vegetation anomalies that are occurring. And we see that the two are linked. What's going on in the ocean is affecting what's going on on land, how the, the food we grow. We know that because in fourth grade, we all drew something called the water cycle. And the water cycle starts in the ocean and it rains on the land. If you look at that, what we project that water cycle to look like in 50 years, we see droughts in much of the area where we now live. And so water is an important resource that we have to worry about in the future. There's also an urgency when it comes to food. We already know over one billion people are undernourished in the world today. And we're only at seven billion. If we look at the future projections for world population, within the lifetime of our students, of our children, the population is going to grow to nine billion. And here's the developed countries in blue. We're about steady. The least developed are about steady, but it's these, these less developed, the ones that already are having trouble feeding their people, where those two billion people are going to join us. So we have to figure out how we're going to take care of them, at least our children will. If we look at the Earth at night, this picture is often shown you know, to, to show where the people are. And you see the high energy usage here in the, in the United States and Europe. And you see the coastal areas light up. But if you gave every person on Earth the same amount of light, the same flashlight to shine up at night, it would look more like this. With this area all filled in to be of equal or greater value than we already have here. These people are going to need energy for food, for water, and we're going to have to go explore for that energy, we're going to have to find renewable energy sources, and we're going to have to provide energy for them. So that's another constraint. So we have to go back to our oceans. Nations will increasingly turn to the sea for these solutions. In the US, the National Science Foundation has started the Ocean Observing Initiative. And I'll show you quickly as we go through that. We start with two southern ocean sites in these harsh conditions that are hardly ever sampled. And we move north to the northern hemisphere, where we have more global sites now in high latitudes. So the high latitudes are covered with global sites. And we have the regional sites and near coastal sites. So these new marine sites that we are building will zoom in to this regional area. And we'll look at the details. Here's that Juan de Fuca plate 
the smallest intact plate in the world with cabled observatories. Those same communication cables that are going transatlantic are now being used for science and deployed on these plates. And if we look, we zoom into what one of those nodes on that cable looks like. Here are the different sensors that will be deployed on there. Laboratories on the sea floor, moorings with profiling sensors, robots that fly within that area, seafloor laboratories to look at the vents that are coming, coming out, and the ROVs from the boats. These are the important advances that we then will bring to science and the public. If we look at this beyond the marine systems, which are the high latitude, the plate scale, and the local coastal dynamics arrays, we have the cyberspace, the network that links all these. And that network provides for the data plus the interactive, the interactivity, the interactive ocean. We can interact with it from anywhere, and we can do that for education and public engagement. We know how to do this, and so we want to apply it to those data sets. Here's some examples of where, from the bottom of the ocean, we can beam the video into control centers onshore, and so we can have that communication. But what we do is we turn those control centers into classrooms. And here, John Delaney can be on the boat working with the ROVs, looking at those black smokers and talking to the students on shore. And then through the internet, we distribute that to the rest of the world. This is important because we have a growing network of cabled observatories planned. And so how do we learn from each other and link these, especially across this band in the northern hemisphere, and especially across the Atlantic? One way we can do that is the experience we've gained through the U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System. So before we were interactive, now we are integrated. And there's three components here, an international component, a national component in the regions. And here's where the regions, this is where the society impact takes place. Because every region has different, different situations. This then goes up to build a national backbone and then international backbones like our international radar networks, our international glider networks. These are the things we are now building. And so if we look at one of those regions in the mid-Atlantic, this is the one that I run, where we have our control center, where we look at satellites in space and radars on the beach and robots under the water to get that Ben Franklin look at the Gulf Stream, where it's warm and the water is blue, to see how the, inter the hurricanes interact with the people, to fly those ro robots under the water, under that satellite data, and get what's going on subsurface where the fish are, and bringing that to kids. And yes, kids can sit in their living room and fly these gliders if they have to. So, Rick Spinrad was at a meeting here. I was at a meeting. I told him about our regional association and the regional gliders that we were flying. He says, that's all well and good. But what about the globe? What can you do about the entire globe? Can you take one of those gliders and modify it and fly it all the way across the Atlantic? Can you do it in a way that inspires students along the way? Here's the longest mission we'd ever done, 500 kilometers. We were very proud of that. He wanted us to go 11 times farther, and he wanted us to do it with three Christmas tree lights worth of batteries. And so we see the other extreme of sample in the ocean. The cables provide high power and bandwidth and a telepresence on the seafloor. This is low power, sustained presence, where we can have many of these small sensors everywhere and omnipresent. Can we build that and demonstrate it? it took us three years. But in 2009, we built one of these gliders, we increased its duration, we ruggedized it, and we built a global roadmap that students could fly this glider across the Atlantic to its recovery in Spain off Bayona, where Columbus's Pinta returned with the first news of the New World. The students there, the school kids that wrote letters that were on board, swarmed the glider. Plaques were put on the walls. The glider was put into the Smithsonian 
It's the first transatlantic vehicle on robot. And students made videos about it. The videos made it to public TV, made many awards. And so not only was it scientists involved, but so were the storytellers. That tradition continues today with transatlantic education programs. The classrooms that we have in the, in the United States are linked to similar classrooms in Europe, and they are flying gliders, test gliders, to develop this long duration capability. And so here's the most recent one that flew from Iceland down to the Canaries. With this in mind, we've been issued a new global challenge, this time from both the Europe and the US, was to now build that global fleet of gliders and coordinate this first robotic circumnavigation. They asked us to revisit that historical track of the HMS Challenger and then train a global network of students along the way. And that's that track. We can see the, the, the 128,000 kilometers of the Challenger we can do it with 16 gliders operated out of 16 control centers and 16 classrooms going out to kids around the world. So, my conclusions. Our planet is changing, the population is growing, Energy demand is increasing, and as the climate and weather are changed, we must remember that the ocean is a critical piece of that that impacts what we do. There are new interactive technologies that enable a new integrated time of ocean exploration. The cables provide this at-sea telepresence. The gliders provide the at-sea omnipresence. You combine them with a cyber structure that allows us to collaborate around the globe. And this is important for our students. Our students that are in our classroom now will be tomorrow's leaders, 40, 50 years from now. That's where all the climate change predictions are for. That's when the population will increase. They will live this change. It's our job now to broaden the opportunities for that community, globalize the science, and promote that cultural interactions. And so we end with a poem just as John would, not by a Nobel laureate, by some, but, but by a teacher, by somebody who's in the trenches, in the profession. And the poem is, I teach for the fire. And you can Google it. You can go see it on the web. You can see it on YouTube. But the important thing is that they say that those who seek to teach must never cease to learn. So I teach for the moment everything catches fire and suddenly starts to burn. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. You've certainly got us off to a tremendous start uh, and really great on timekeeping. The inspiration uh, and the challenge that has been laid out in our first talk, uh, the mantle will now be, take, be taken up by Michael uh, St. John, a Canadian working in Europe in Denmark, a man who's combining an understanding of the animals in, uh, in the ocean, the biology of the ocean with the physics of the ocean. Uh, and Mike, the floor is yours. First, I'd like to thank Peter and Jeffrey for inviting me to give this presentation. And uh, I'm supposed to be focusing on the ecology of the North Atlantic, um, mostly the North Atlantic ecosystem, how it works. And I look at the North Atlantic or the Atlantic from this vision. I'm looking at the gyres in the North Atlantic and the organisms that live in these gyres. I'm the coordinator of Eurobasin, which is a, an FP7 program, which is looking at how climate change and fisheries are driving the structure of the North Atlantic ecosystems and the implications of this, these changes in structure for climate, for uh, carbon sequestration and hence feedbacks to climate. Um, I was given a mission here that was to explain to you a little bit about the hydrodynamics and Scott has done a little bit for me on that. 
Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about ecosystems and ecology, but more about how they're being affected than rather about how they work. I'm going to say a little bit about the, the, the functioning of these systems. And in the end, I'm going to tell you about some key knowledge ga gaps which we need to address and key issues which we should be fo focusing upon. Okay. Martin, can you give me a bit of a, um, let's see, the animation? Over here? Nope, I guess we've lost it. Anyway, this longest river, oh, here it comes. This is a, uh, a um, simulation from NASA about the longest river. And we call it the thermal hill ice circulation in physical oceanography. And we've already talked about the warm water surface we're on surface water moving around the globe and actually going down in certain areas to depth. Where is this thing here? This is areas where deep water is formed. So the waters, the warm waters come along here, they get into this area here, they cool, taking CO2 down with them as they sink. And also biological particles going down to depth and taking large amounts of, of CO2 to depth. And this is actually called the lungs of the, of the, of the earth. This is where most of the carbon is being pushed down and removed from, from the atmosphere. And so then this goes down and circulates in the deep water through the oceans. There are other areas here in, in, the, in the Southern Ocean and also here just off Greenland. But the major area for carbon uh, deposition or transfer to the deep ocean is occurring right here. Okay. The, as, the, as you're all familiar with this figure, the IPCC from 2007, telling us about climate change, how the Earth is going to warm. And this is the general idea of what's going to happen. It's going to get much warmer in some areas, and we'll see some cooling in other areas as well. But we have major uncertainties, and when, it, when we put these kind of predictions up, CO2 emissions are going to be driven by social, political, economic, and geological constraints. Atmospheric CO2 carbon sinks and carbon climate, carbon, car, uh, climate carbon feedbacks are not well understood right now, and that's one of the things we're working on in this Euro Basin program. Climate sensitivities, we're not very clear on how clouds drive this system and water vapor, which does have big impacts on the, the flux of heat into the, into the surface ocean. But we are definitely going to be seeing changes in stratification in these systems. Stratification means that the two layers there's a buoyancy difference. The surface layer becomes lighter, and the deep, deep water stays rather dense, roughly the same density, although we are seeing warming in deep ocean right now. But this has major implications for the phytoplankton in the system. If you look at our tropics and, and mid-latitudes, the way we're sitting right now, you've got a lot of mixing going on in nutrient flux, and here are the phytoplankton cells sitting up in the surface layer. They've got lots of light, and away they go. With warming, you're going to have more stratification. This is going to reduce the mixing. There's going to be less nutrients for these phytoplankton, which drive the biological pump, and so therefore the production will be less. So it'll be a decrease in plants in the surface, which has major implications because these are the base of the food web for higher trophic levels. So your fish stocks are going to be impacted. At higher latitudes, right now you've got deep mixing. You don't have that much biomass being formed. It's, it's generally lower, presumed to be lower, with climate warming and freshening, you're going to start to see the stratification take off. And you're going to have reduced mixing will increase plankton in the illuminated surface layers. So we predict that there will be higher, or we believe there'll be higher phytoplankton biomass, so thus our system should be more productive. Unfortunately, the evidence seems to be going in a different direction. Um, this is some work by Boyce in 2010, where they they took a, this is over a 100-year time series of phytoplankton production from all sorts of measurements globally. And if you look at what's been going on, you can see this is the rate of change of chlorophyll per meter cube per year. It's something on the order of a 1% decline globally of phytoplankton production in the last 120 years. And if you look in our North Atlantic, where I like to play, you can see this has been dropping as well. This is an area which actually has some of the most productive fish stocks on the planet, blue whiting, herring, mackerel, these are very high abundances. Also, you may have heard about the Newfoundland cod. These stocks are in a state of decline. We're starting, the food web is, not, is potentially not supporting them quite as well. Okay. Climate is also impacting upon the next trophic level, the zooplankton. This is some work by Gregory Bogond in 2004. Um, 
what you're basically seeing here is a cold mixed, mixed water, cold temperate mixed water species in the period from 1958 to 1981. And this is their distribution. The, the high abundance is in red and the low abundance is in blue. As you move into 2003, 2005, you can see that these midwater or these cold temperate species have basically been shifted a little bit north, but they've declined dramatically. Now, these, this is the prey for our fish stocks, the larval fish, the juvenile fish, and this is driving their production. If you look at the subarctic species, you see in this early period, they're rather high around Iceland in this area, but as you get into 2003, 2005, they basically moved out of the system. So you're seeing a restructuring of our systems with climate change. This is rather worrying. In, especially in light of the biological pump, we're seeing a reduction in primary production, a change in the zooplankton community, What's happening with the flux of carbon? This we don't know yet. There's been a lot of discussion about the trophic cascade in the literature. And this is some evidence that's telling us it really does work. Um, a friend of mine, Ken Frank from Canada, another Canadian, did some work on the Scotian Shelf. And this is how we believe our systems function. You've got a bottom-up approach, which is basically the production. Climate's driving the phytoplankton production, which drives the zooplankton production, which drives the, the prey on the zooplankton, which drives the small pelagic fish, which in the end drives the large predators, versus the top-down approach. So this controls the production this way. A top-down approach is where these guys control the structure this way. So the large fish selectively graze here, reduce the pressure, reduce this population, which then releases this population. So that goes up, whereas, and then when this goes up, this population, small zooplankton goes down. When this goes down, the phytoplankton comes up. That's how it works in theory. The reality of it is over here. It does work. Okay. Here's a time series from 1962 to 2002 produced by the Canadians of the ground fish. This is basically driven by Atlantic cod. And so the zero is the long-term mean of the population. And you see here in the early part of the period, in the early 60s, we had a positive period where there was a lot of these ground fish. If you looked at the small pelagic population, you see this flip there down. If you look at the zooplankton, because the small pelagic population is down, you see the zooplankton goes up. And the zooplankton who's grazing on the phytoplankton go up, the phytoplankton population goes down. Later in the time series, you all know about the drop in production or the population biomass of this cod stock. Here we're in a low period. You see the small pelagics come up, then the zooplankton in response go down, and the phytoplankton comes up. So the question, when I first saw this presentation or this figure or this paper, the question was, what happens to the carbon? What's happening to the biological carbon pump? I asked a number of my friends who work in, in biogeochemistry, and they basically said, we have really no idea. We don't understand how this system functions here. We don't know really well, or we don't know how the, the biology controls, the higher trophic levels control this flux. And that became the mission of Eurobasin, this seventh framework program. Five minutes, 10 minutes? 10, all, all day. <laughs> OK. Um, but this is, this is getting into the biological carbon pump story. And you should probably be aware of this. This is driven, the phytoplankton production is driven by solar energy. This, these phytoplankton are in the surface layer. And they, as they bloom and die and sink out, they go down in particles which they're also grazed here by zooplankton in that layer. These particles sink out and are grazed by zooplankton. And eventually, some of it sediments out to the deep ocean. And in this deep ocean environment, this carbon is basically removed from the system. And if we look at the carbon in the ocean, the deep ocean, the magnitude is far greater on the order of oof, 50 times higher than that in the atmosphere. Anyway, this is a major pool of carbon. And it's being driven by the solubility pump, which is the, basically the saturation, and the biological pump, which is the, the flow from the biology. But it's not just phytoplankton, which is what everybody's been looking at. Zooplankton species, and as I've already showed you, these are changing dramatically in this key, highly productive environment. It's the zooplankton that are actually impacting, having a major impact upon this. You see a number, this is the fecal pellets, which are basically contain the leftovers from small microzooplankton and from phytoplankton. And these sink out at different rates. 
So different zooplankton species have different impacts upon the flux of carbon. And as our ecosystems are changing, this rate of flux is going to change, and our sequestration is going to change. Whoops. I've shown you a fisheries impact. I've talked a little bit about an, the impact of fisheries on this system. Now, the fellow by the name of Halpern and, and crew generated a paper for science, or sorry, nature, a few years ago, where they looked at the human impacts on the marine, on marine ecosystems globally. And they categorized human, the impacts as fishing, pollution, invasive species, and acidification. Um, also, temperature rise. So here is, is this a simulation going on now? No, it's just my eyes going. OK, anyway, you can see globally the areas of high impact of human activities. Here, this is, called, this is sea. This is the northern North Sea. OK, China Sea. Caribbean is also targeted. But you can also see other areas, like Australia, where you have very low impacts. So we know where these impacts are taking place. We know what they are. Acidification, temperature rise, invasive species. We're immense number of studies on these things. The problem is we don't know how they impact upon the system itself. We can do a correlation and say, OK, acidification leads to this amount of degradation of this amount of material. But the system itself, the outcome of that system, be it carbon flux here or fish stock dynamics and biodiversity, is determined by the system. This is a nonlinear interaction. It's complex. There are multiple feedbacks in it. And our approaches right now are rather deterministic and lack feedbacks. The feedback I just mentioned to you was this carbon flux, the flow because of the phytoplankton. So there's a feedback here. The phytoplankton sinking out remove carbon from the system, which then reduces the, the potential for carbon in the atmosphere and, and so on. So it can reduce it. But if you add, if the carbon starts coming out due to global warming, then you're going to increase the heating. So this is the kind of feedbacks we're thinking about. This is, these systems are called complex adaptive systems. And the emergent properties of these systems are fish stocks, the dynamics of fish stocks, the flux of carbon, carbon sequestration. And you've all heard about regime shifts. These things, a, t a number of these, this is actually a food web for a herring. So the, uh, sitting up here is a herring. And these are all the species that interact with this herring. If a number of these species break down, i.e. you're lost in the system, you may go through something that's called a regime shift. And we've seen this happen in the Northeast Pacific. What happened was you went from a system dominated by fish to a system dominated by shrimp. Okay? We're seeing this globally happening, happening all over the place in many different systems. Five minutes. I've got to talk faster. OK, I was asked to tell you something about knowledge gaps. And this is from my, my perception of where the knowledge gaps are. Who are the key biological players influencing the efficiency of the biological pump and higher trophic level production? We really don't know that because of the switching of the, of the, of the uh, shall I say, fu the function and the, and the productivity of different groups. How resilient are these players to changes in ocean temperature? This is a driver of changes in stratification and circulation. Many of our species have to be fish stocks in particular. The eggs are laid in one area, and the larva and are, are moved. Eggs and larvae are moved to a, hab a, a juvenile habitat or a larval habitat that allows them to survive. Stratification, global warming, will change these circulation, circulation patterns. Ocean acidification, huge question. And we're seeing increases in acidification in the ocean right now. I'm sure you're all aware of it. But one thing that you're probably not aware of is that this, the deep ocean is becoming more acidic. And the level, of, the level is rising, i.e., from it's, it's, it's moving towards the surface. So it's becoming a more and more acid ocean. It's shifting up towards the surface. Um, changes in ecosystem, in ecosystem structure, biodiversity due to, to exploitation patterns. We're seeing this through many of our systems right now. What are the ecological processes modifying the flux of carbon through the mesopelagic layer? We've got a very large stock of fish down there, mesopelagic fish, which are potentially a huge resource to be exploited. But we don't know what they do in controlling the flux of carbon from these areas. And it's very clear that something going, is going on there, but we don't know what it is. And this carbon game, if it's not sinking out, 
what is happening is not sinking, that means it's being pushed back into the surface layer, which means it's getting back to the atmosphere. Basin shelf communication. We really don't know very much about the flow between the shelves and the open ocean. And it, we need to know is this, if this linkage is important for species dynamics and carbon sequestration, because our most productive marine ecosystems are on the shelf. And the transport of carbon off the shelf has been postulated to be very important for the sequestration in deep ocean. So my big question, and I think for most marine scientists who work in the North Atlantic, is how will North Atlantic marine ecosystems and their key species and services, fisheries, carbon flux, respond in the future to the multiple stressors of climate change and exploitation? That's the take home message. These are very key issues for the future of the planet, for our future in the planet. I shouldn't say the future of the planet. The planet will be here without us. But this carbon sequestration, as I said, the North Atlantic is one of the key areas, and we don't understand exactly what's going on there. And of course, these massive fish stocks, which are now depleted. In order to address this question, a basin scale EU North American activity is necessary. We can't do this alone. And I'll say th again, thank you to the conveners for inviting me. I hope this has given you a little more information about what's going on in our system. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Again, I think we're getting a common theme. How can we understand it? How can we get the information we need to understand it? It's changing, it's changing rapidly, but not predictably. How do we get to be able to predict what's going to happen? Our next, our next speaker uh, is a dear old friend of mine, Dr. Michael, or Mike Crosby, as I know him better. Uh, he has survived 30 years of working in the university system, through the federal government system, uh, at both NOAA and NSF in Hawaii, and back to um, the third level world again in Florida. Um, he's no stranger to Ireland, and has been a, been a great partner to Ireland in establishing scientific partnerships in the past. Mike is going to talk, I hope, a little bit about the socioeconomic interactions, the relationships between humans and this Atlantic Ocean as we move to the future. Mike. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Heffernan, uh, and I appreciate the kind invitation to join this uh, special session and to the organizers of uh, this entire conference, ESOF uh, 2012, I suppose we're in 2012 now. And I want to thank you all as well for being here. I know it's... Uh, getting on in the day and everyone's energy level is, is starting to decline. So I'm just asking you all to take a deep breath of oxygen, reinvigorate yourself because we're going to have a couple more talks and then some lively discussion and I hope you all will, will engage in that as well. Um, what I'd like to do is not repeat um, the outstanding uh, points that were made in the first two presentations which really laid a, a strong foundation for the stories that I'd like to tell uh, about the connections, the challenges, uh, and the opportunities uh, in our shared Atlantic environment. And the, the background picture for this opening slide, uh, I hope will be familiar to at least the Irish in the, in the crowd here today. This is, this is a, a rather famous painting, uh, an immigrant ship in Dublin Bay. It's uh, right here in the National Gallery, I think around, uh, let's see, on the other side of the Liffey. Uh, if you'd like to see it. Um, but it, I, I purposefully use it to show that human connection, uh, the human connection that we have on both sides of the Atlantic. My own family, my grandparents uh, came from County Wexford. My, my father lived uh, his early life, uh, uh, early years there uh, himself. So I come as, a, as an example of, of the very strong human connection uh, across the Atlantic. And I'll deal with some um, whoa, I didn't do anything. What happened? Um, let's see if I can try to get this back up here. Uh, I don't know what happened. We're having a technical glitch. Um, but um, what I want to try to do is um, begin with mentioning that very strong human connection, um, show some examples that might resonate with some of you in the audience about uh, the connections uh, between both sides uh, of the Atlantic, and then come back again. Uh, and I'd like to end with, I think, 
what is both um, uh, one of our uh, greatest uh, challenges and opportunities, which is the human dimension of, of how we promote um, wise stewardship uh, of our shared uh, resources. And I think we might need to get uh, a technical hand out here. I don't know if your person is, is, is the type I usually play with in the movie that's great. Uh, Uh, technology is a wonderful thing, isn't it? When it works. And humans don't get in the way, like me. Okay. So you've seen um, some wonderful um, uh, graphics and displays of, of the current of the oceans from ancient times uh, and how the, 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 the knowledge of the currents have evolved. And clearly, the currents are something that ties together. This, this model. Um, from the HICOM uh, Gadai uh, program was provided to me by uh, Bob Ginsberg, uh, excuse me, Bob uh, Weisberg uh, from the University of South Florida. And the reason I put that on here is Bob uh, was uh, uh, playing around with glass floats in North Carolina over a decade ago and had his business card in him. And he is still to this day getting calls from people on the west coast of Ireland who find those glass balls coming up. So there's clearly uh, uh, connections there. Uh, and again, some of the more uh, sophisticated models um, that we saw in some of our earlier talks. But the, the connection um, with the currents is only one way that the oceans are, that the ocean connects both uh, North America and Europe. The other is a strong connection that both the EU and North America and the US in this case that I'm showing here, uh, the oceans are very directly connected to our economy. And, uh, the economy is something that, that does make the world go round. And this is just a quick graphic to show the millions of jobs that are directly, directly related to the marine uh, environment. But if one were to take uh, the next order up, the, the spin-off and related uh, jobs and employment, you would be orders of magnitude higher and orders of magnitude higher in terms of the percentage of the gross uh, domestic product of the EU, and in this case, the EU 27. Uh, and the U.S. You've seen wonderful presentations in the first two talks about some of the threats that we have. Many of you have heard about these threats, overfishing, pollution, climate change, energy extraction, et cetera. I, I won't belabor those. Um, but um, governments on both sides, in Europe and uh, in the U.S., have recognized that these, these are very precious resources that we have in the Atlantic. Uh, our economy and society is dependent upon uh, these resources, yet they are under rather significant and increasing uh, stress and threat. So on both sides of the Atlantic, various programs have, have been brought for uh, in recent years that I think are, are, are very similar. If you look at the summaries of both of these, the, the recent national ocean policy um, that was uh, established uh, in the United States, uh, and the SEAS uh, uh, European research area that was also established, you will see similarities. I won't read this for you, but you'll see similarities between the main thrusts of both of these programs. And in both programs, you'll also see the need to promote uh, international partnerships. Because quite frankly, um, a lot of this wonderful science uh, that you're, you're hearing about uh, today and, and over the, the next couple of days here, it, it costs money. Okay, and we all know that we're in a very tight economic uh, climate right now. And governments around the world, Europe and the US and around the world, are thinking about how can we tighten the belt? Where can we cut? Um, and this is, this is where it's important that we come together and partner. Neither country, and I think uh, the previous speakers have mentioned this themselves, neither the EU nor North America can do this by themselves. We have to partner together. So the theme of this whole session really is not only shared resources, but, but the underlying need, the priority for us to partner these programs uh, in a trans transboundary uh, effort. What I'd like to do, though, is, is talk to you, uh, share a few stories that I think will illustrate uh, at maybe a more um, uh, understandable or personal uh, level uh, the connections uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And the first story I'd like to talk to you about is Vasco da Gama. Now, this isn't the human explorer Vasco da Gama, but this is Johnny Vasco da Gama. 
Uh, Johnny is a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. And if I can get this little thing to uh, work here, uh, Kemp's Ridleys are an endangered species of sea turtle that are normally found here in the Gulf of Mexico. And this Kemp's Ridley sea turtle that was undoubtedly born right here uh, in the Gulf of Mexico made its way on those currents that you saw in the previous talks up and across the Atlantic and right by the, the, the west coast of, of Ireland, the northern uh, coast of Ireland, and around to the Netherlands as a juvenile. Now, that's, this is not normal, but it shows the connection um, that can happen between them. And it also shows, I want this story to illustrate the partnerships of institutions that enabled that turtle that was found near dead as a juvenile in the Netherlands to be, that was in 2008, late 2008, to slowly be rehabilitated in the Netherlands, then to be transferred down to Portugal to be further rehabilitated, and then was flown last year, at the end of last year, from Portugal to my home institution of Moat Marine Lab, where we have a, a rather significant sea turtle hospital and a sea turtle conservation program. And we completed the restoration and tagged this Kemp's Ridley turtle, Johnny Vasco da Gama, here with a radio tracking uh, device and released him in December. After three years, he was released. And I should say she, because initially they spelled his name with a Y, thinking it was a male, and it's actually a female, as it turns out we found when it was at Moat, and released it. And here is the telemetry tag data that shows that Johnny Vasco da Gama, after this enormous trip across the Atlantic and with the help of institutions in the Netherlands, Portugal, and Moat Marine Lab coming together, released this turtle, endangered species, back into the Gulf, and it's a success story. But it takes those kinds of partnerships. Uh, this is a, a, a segue I can just mention to you, those who may not be familiar with Moat, it's, it's a completely independent institution, been around for 60 years. I've got about 100 research staff there, 200 total staff, about 32 uh, PhDs. We conduct research all around the world in every field you can think of, uh, and we have a number of, of partnerships in the international arena. Um, being independent in the U.S. allows us to also partner with Cuban scientists, by the way, and we have Cuban marine researchers coming up to work with us all the time, and our scientists go down there as well. We have, in addition to our main campus in Sarasota, Florida, which I invite you all to come and visit. That's where our public aquarium is. We have a 200-acre aquaculture park inland, a smaller field lab here, Charlotte Harbor, a major research facility in the Florida Keys, and an education center in the Florida Keys. Now, you, you may not be familiar with Moat, but you're familiar with something that happened close by Moat in the Gulf of Mexico, which is the BP Deepwater Horizon oil blowout. And this was a massive, massive uh, uh, environmental insult. Um, many of you are familiar with it. It happened over a course of months. And just to share with you the orders of magnitude here, um, there were two, over 200 million gallons of oil that were released at great depth, uh, deeper than, than any previous blowouts, which is orders of magnitude greater than Exxon Valdez and greater even than the Ixtoc uh, blowout. But a, a distinct uh, uh, occurrence here was also not just the depth, but two million gallons of dispersant that was issued at depth. Um, this led to a, quite a bit of the oil never reaching the surface, which is a good thing in some respect, but perhaps not the best of things in other respects. And the reason that I bring up this whole issue of the um, blowout gets back to that energy extraction threat that we have. We certainly must go after uh, energy, at least in the near term in terms of oil, while we are developing alternative sustainable uh, sources. But you have those same threats here in the Atlantic that we have in the Gulf, and it's all connected. If it wasn't for this anomaly here of this gyre up here, keeping the oil up in the northern part of the Gulf, that oil could have been entrained in the Gulf Stream and come around and up. Would it ever have reached over to Europe? No, not at the surface level. It never would have. But the reason I'm bringing this up is that it's what you don't see that can bite you sometimes. And in this case, the oil was, was uh, uh, collected and dispersed uh, at the surface. It was burned. We, had, we did have impact to the shoreline, and it was horrendous, the, the impact that did happen, but it was small. 
What many of us are much more concerned about is the oil that we can't see that is still existing at great depth. And this story is going to link back, believe it or not, to Europe in a moment. Um, this is just a, a picture of some of the deep water canyons, uh, thousands of feet deep where there's oil plumes. Uh, and we're continuing to find uh, examples of those plumes. And what's going on at over 4,000 feet deep is that critical fishery habitat is being uh, killed, is being destroyed by these oil plumes. This is some deep water coral here, and uh, this is a, uh, a brittle star um, that is impacted. None of this is normal, by the way, for those of you that are, are, are familiar with it. Um, and we heard uh, the previous speaker talk about trophic cascades, and that's the point I'm, I want to bring home here, is that you don't even have to have a PhD to see these kinds of cascades. This slide here is illustrative of some newspaper clippings that occurred in Gulf uh, State mag uh, uh, newspapers in the recreational fishing sections. The recreational fishermen and the boat chartermen were all noticing large pelagics that normally are far from shore coming in close to shore. They were noticing all kinds of species in close to shore. It was great for fishing. You didn't have to go offshore so far. But what was happening was these large pelagics, these predators in many cases, but large pelagics, were coming into habitat that they don't normally exist in. What happens when those fish all of a sudden come into an area where they don't normally happen? What happens when you put a wolf back into a forest that uh, hasn't had wolves in it for 100, 200 years? There are impacts, and I won't go into all of the trophic cascades, but basically we heard the previous speaker talk about both the bottom, the bottom up, the top down trophic cascades. I would submit to you there's a third kind of trophic cascade, and that is if critical habitat is destroyed, like essential fish habitat, those deep water corals, or other key habitats. All of these things can lead to trophic cascades. How does a trophic cascade, a domino that falls in the Gulf of Mexico, potentially impact the East Atlantic in, in Europe? Well, let's follow this through. Sometimes it doesn't happen right away. Exxon Valdez, it was four years after Exxon Valdez and Prince William Sound. The herring population crashed. Now, much research and retrospective analysis indicates that there may be very strong connections to the oil spill a lack of reproductive success, the herring population has never recovered, never recovered, but it took four years to see it. We have large migratory species, large pelagic species, whale sharks are one of them, and we show here the number of whale shark sightings that occurred right around the deep water horizon. This is prime uh, whale shark uh, area. Were they impacted? We don't know for sure yet, because when whale sharks die, where do they go? They sink. They don't float to the surface. Here's another large pelagic, bluefin tuna. And you can see again the bluefin tuna uh, line going right through where the deep water horizon was. Well, what does Gulf of Mexico tuna have to do with Europe? Well, here's what it has to do with Europe. That tuna population extends all throughout the Atlantic. Now, there's a western set of breeders and an eastern set of breeders. And I'm, I'm going into dangerous territory here with David uh, uh, sitting here at the end of the table since he was uh, one of Moat's uh, first eminent uh, uh, scientists in, in fishery science, uh, and he, he may be able to talk a little bit more on this when, uh, when he uh, has his comments. But you'll see that there's very strong connection between the Gulf of Mexico populations, the western breeders, and in fact, the radio tagging shows that there is uh, uh, transport back and forth across the Atlantic of this key bluefin tuna stock. Now, there's also overfishing pressures, and we heard about that earlier as well. Um, there's overfishing pressures with sharks in general. This, this uh, was prepared for me by one of our uh, uh, scientists, Bob Huter, at Moat uh, Marine Lab, and it shows some of the radio tagging uh, data of uh, the blue sharks in the Atlantic, in the North Atlantic stock, and showing the connectivity uh, from North America over to Europe between this species as well. Um, so we share quite a bit in terms of fisheries, and you heard other fish species uh, mentioned earlier as examples. Who, who cares about sharks well, and the collapse or, or the depletion or the decline of sharks, which we're seeing all around uh, the world and especially in the Atlantic? Well, one of the reasons we need to care about them is 
Research is showing at Moat and elsewhere that there are distinctive cancer therapies that are being developed. We're developing them, other people are, from many of these elasma branks, wound healing technologies, but also the impact ecologically and economically to tourism, to fisheries in general. So it's very important. One of the other areas that we think might help in terms of the threat of, of uh, depleting fish stocks is land-based sustainable aquaculture and partnering in land-based sustainable aquaculture. It's environmentally friendly and sound. It reduces the impact on the wild populations. Uh, and it's a great partnership program that already exists around the, uh, both sides of the Atlantic. Here's a listing of just some of the partners that uh, scientists at Moat have with uh, uh, aquaculture folks, uh, researchers in Spain, in Scotland, um, we have uh, Germany, uh, throughout the Caribbean, and there's any one of you could probably tell the same kinds of stories, but partnerships, international partnerships in uh, land-based sustainable aquaculture is an opportunity uh, that I think across the Atlantic we can build upon. One that I can't not mention, I must mention here, uh, as a great uh, international partnership across the Atlantic was one that I had the privilege of, of uh, building along with uh, Peter in 1995 when I was at NOAA. Uh, I believe it still is, is ongoing uh, today and it's an outstanding example. And for those of you in Ireland and Europe, uh, the Marine Institute is, is really uh, a powerful, powerful research institution. And, and the ship right across the Liffey here from you, I hope many of you will be able to see it's state of the art. Um, and, and it's just magnificent what, what they can do now with the technology that the Marine Institute is bringing to bear. Um, especially in the, able, in the area of uh, ocean observations, uh, climate change, we heard the previous speakers talking about um, the next generation, if you will. This slide shows really, I think, the, the, the outgoing generation. When you see the ocean observation um, uh, network uh, fully implemented, uh, if the funds really are uh, secured and provided for the long-term implementation and operations of that. Th these kinds of ocean obs that you're seeing here related to climate change in the oceans will seem uh, archaic, but they are intimately linked with the commerce, the fisheries, and um, both the ecological and economic viability of our shared resources uh, in the Atlantic. And of course, you can go online and look at all of the different uh, observation systems, but again, these will pale compared to what is, is about to be implemented. One of the areas I was very pleased to hear the previous uh, speaker mention, and I wanted to really focus a bit of a spotlight on, it related to climate change is ocean acidification. Um, most of, of the world has really been focused on the temperature aspect of, of climate change. I really feel, and many scientists feel, that ocean acidification may be the bigger, longer term, and more impactful um, uh, negative uh, impact uh, of this. And these slides were provided by my program director for uh, ocean acidification studies, uh, Dr. Emily Hall um, at, at Moat. There are a number of other um, ocean acidification facilities around the world. Moat uh, has its own as well uh, with deep water, uh, pure seawater that is coming up that is naturally acidified. Some of these others in Papua New Guinea one in Italy, and there's others around the world in Australia that exist. I think we should be partnering together uh, in this respect. And on the last slide, I, I will, I failed to highlight the fact that I'm so pleased, re I think it was just in uh, last month, I think it was, that um, the Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center was established by the International Atomic Energy Commission here in Europe, uh, affiliated with Monaco uh, Environmental Laboratories. And I think that's, that's a terrific step forward uh, in terms of uh, international partnerships uh, related to ocean acidification. And then I want to end um, by coming back to the, to the human element again. And I was very pleased that earlier today uh, uh, there was a session on ocean literacy, and I, I had the pleasure of sitting in for several of those, those talks. But in the end, in the end, we can have the best science proposed, the best science funded, but it really takes a, a change in how human society at a global level views the oceans. And that means we need to enhance, significantly enhance, the level of global ocean literacy in our public. We need to share a vision for this global ocean literacy. Uh, and this is definitions here of what constitutes 
an ocean literate public, one that understands the ocean's influences on human society and our influence on the oceans. They understand the basic principles of ocean dynamics and ecological systems in the, in the oceans. They can actually talk intelligently, uh, perhaps not at a PhD uh, oceanography level, but intelligently about ocean systems. And most importantly, and very importantly for funding of science in these tight economic times, is that an ocean literate public can make informed and responsible decisions regarding the oceans, its natural resources, and funding the science that is absolutely essential for the wise stewardship of these oceans. And what I would like to propose is an informal science education research initiative that's focused on the oceans, on the marine environment. Uh, and specifically, this research initiative to, should design and test, quantitatively test, insert rigor, scientific rigor, in what are the best informal science education approaches for enhancing the literacy, the ocean literacy of, of the public. Uh, and aquariums around the world are really an optimal place for this initiative to be uh, implemented. And I would request, uh, I'll announce here today that Moat is going to put their money where their mouth is, literally, and we're about to announce a new competitive program in which we would have a Moat eminent scholar of informal science education, um, that we will have people come to Moat for two to three months uh, at a time on a sabbatical, uh, these will be experts in, in the research of education methods. They will conduct their innovative research at our public aquarium, the largest attraction in southwest Florida. They design and test these methods of informal science education, and we'll cover their salary and their per diem for that. And what I'd like to see is Europe implement the same kind of program so that we can actually link these programs across the Atlantic and perhaps focus, in fact, on the Atlantic itself. Because in the end, it's about what this slide illustrates. It's the next generation that we must ensure has a significantly enhanced level of ocean literacy. If we are to promote the wise stewardship, to address the challenges that, we've, that we face, and to take advantage of the opportunities out there for international partnership uh, in the science, in the conduct of marine science, and in fact, in the stewardship of these precious shared resources. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to move us on to the fourth of our keynote addresses now. And if anybody feels like a stretch, don't be shy. You can get up. You're in Ireland. You can stretch and, uh, and relax. Um, it, it is a pleasure to introduce uh, our final keynote speaker. Uh, he works very closely with Ireland's commissioner for Europe, uh, who has responsibility for research and innovation. Uh, he is a man who has a great depth of experience in managing research service delivery and in managing policy areas of research at a European level. Uh, he's a man I've gone to develop a very deep professional respect for and one I'm looking forward to working very closely with in the years to come uh, in taking on some of these challenges that are being posed for us. Robert Jan Smits, Director General for Research and Innovation. Thank you very much for uh, the kind introduction and uh, I'm very impressed by uh, the speakers and uh, their uh, very comprehensive uh, uh, presentations. I would like to bring in the perspective from a funding agency and uh, to see to what extent uh, we indeed could provide support financial support, but also support in other means to really make sure that important research activities in this field are being pursued. Um, I'm not going to repeat what uh, some of the previous speakers already here mentioned, uh, why the oceans are so central to our well-being and prosperity. Um, you mentioned the climate regulators, the sources of food, uh, energy. Um, you mentioned indeed very clearly all the speakers, uh, the importance of uh, the oceans for many, many, many different uh, aspects of our daily life. Um, I think also a clear message I got from the previous uh, presentations is, of course, uh, the uh, accumulated effect of all our activities, and that is leading increasingly to a deterioration of the marine environment, and that it is important in that context that we really work in partnership across the Atlantic to address some of these uh, major uh, challenges. 
And as a matter of fact, um, we are from the side of the European Union doing that. Uh, we have a very comprehensive uh, program called the Framework Program, which is running um, with a budget of uh, around 53 billion uh, euro. And marine research uh, has a very important uh, place in our program in uh, different areas. Um, just to give you an example uh, how many projects we have been funding, we have been funding uh, something like a thousand projects, a total of uh, amount of two billion euro over the last uh, number of years. Um, so it again, again shows very clearly that we take uh, um, marine research uh, very seriously um, from different angles, uh, the energy angle, the climate change angle, uh, the water angle, the food angle. So we are really quite committed to fund research, first quality research, on these important uh, elements I, I just mentioned. Um, examples of projects. Um, I have two examples which I brought uh, with me. Um, I think both of them have already been uh, mentioned. It is, of course, important that we are having some kind of a coordination between the different uh, uh, research funding agencies, the marine research funding agencies, to see where indeed we can cooperate, where we indeed can arrive at scale and scope uh, and perhaps even go to further specialization, or also where we can identify gaps of uh, activities which are not covered by uh, any of the uh, agencies. Um, so this is quite an important uh, activity for us. It's um, defining strategic research agendas uh, in the Atlantic uh, Mediterranean Black Sea uh, areas. Uh, so it's for us a very important platform for policy making and indeed uh, aligning the different funding agencies and making sure that marine research is done in the most effective way across uh, the globe. Another project which was uh, um, mentioned by the previous speaker is Eurobasin. Um, this is also a project which uh, is funded by the European Union. Uh, it's all about uh, uh, the basin scale analysis and synthesis and integration. A uh, number of partners are involved in this project, some uh, 24 partners from nine countries, and it's uh, led by our colleagues in, the, in Denmark. So from that point of view, um, through these projects, we would like to indeed um, uh, enhance research activities. Uh, we would like to bring different partners together, and we want to indeed make sure that uh, knowledge is shared, that expertise is uh, exchanged, and that access is provided to research uh, facilities. Now, you may know that we are at the moment uh, discussing our proposal for a next funding program for the period 2014-2020. This has the name Horizon 2020, and uh, it is uh, a program which uh, has been uh, proposed by the European Commission to the Member States and the European Parliament. Total budget some 80 billion euro. 80 billion euro. And what is quite interesting, if you look at the total um, proposal um, for the EU budget 2014-2020, um, this is the only area where we see a dramatic increase. And it shows that uh, when we are in Brussels at the European Commission talking about uh, the knowledge economy, we do more than just talking, we're also willing to invest in it. So this is an area where we are uh, going to invest uh, enormously in the years to come, because it is important indeed uh, that we invest in ed education in science and innovation uh, to address the grand societal challenges, but also indeed to strengthen the competitiveness of uh, the industries. Now, Horizon 2020 is going to be based on uh, three main uh, objectives, uh, boosting excellent science, making sure that uh, we can have industrial leadership and addressing the uh, societal challenges. Now, inside the um, Horizon 2020 activities, marine research is going to take a very important place. As a matter of fact, uh, we will find it back in the energy research programs, uh, marine renewable energy, in the transport uh, um, activities, uh, we are going to have quite a dimension uh, in the field of the marine. Um, fisheries, aquaculture, and marine biotechnology will be a priority. The climate, uh, of course, and uh, resources exploitation, and uh, last but not least, research infrastructures, by indeed making sure that the different research vessels which are existing work in close harmony, that there are exchanges of researches, and that these vessels are used to the most effective means. But we are also looking more and more into the complex matter of uh, data storage, data handling, data interpretation, scientific repositories. These are all very important uh, issues which we need to address, not only in the European broad context, but across the Atlantic as well, with our partners uh, on the other side, 
because these are, as previous speakers have mentioned, such a complex matters that we indeed need to partner up. Since uh, we are close to uh, the end of the session and uh, everyone is of course looking forward to questions and answers, I decided to keep it extremely short. But I just want to leave for you with two messages. I think first of all, we from the side of the European Union are committed and remain committed to invest in uh, marine research. You can count on that. In our future programs, we are completely open to cooperation uh, with partners from across the globe. And of course, the partners on the other side of the Atlantic are a preferential partner, let me be clear. Uh, and we have indeed uh, excellent examples of cooperation in the past. But there's a third message also I would like to pass, and that it is, it is of course important that we do these research activities, that we collect the data, that we indeed uh, make sure that we extend the frontage of knowledge, but it's even more important that policymakers are indeed picking up these messages and base their policies on scientific facts and figures. And if I look at the, the recent Rio events, uh, I must say that I'm somewhat disappointed that uh, we do not see all governments basing their policies on scientific facts and figures. And that is a key message also I would like to see. It's very important that we don't only collect the data, disseminate the data, but also that policymakers are convinced that these are the right data on which they have to base their future policies. Even if these policies are painful in the short term, they will indeed uh, the, uh, make, uh, make security and bring security to future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, uh, thank you. Now we're going to invite uh, our four other panelists to make uh, short five-minute contributions. They can do it in the form of questions in response to what they've heard, posing questions for a discussion, or additional contributions. Uh, I'm going to switch back over the Atlantic to start again. Uh, a man who has had much experience in science itself and now as uh, head of the ocean science programs in the National Science Foundation, uh, Dr. David Conover. Uh, thank you, David. Peter. Is, is this microphone on? Can you hear me? Um, I want to reflect a little bit more on uh, some of the historical aspects that uh, Scott mentioned, because I think it's important to realize that it's only recently that ocean scientists uh, have fully embraced the study of human impacts on the ocean. Um, when I was a graduate student, and I once, well, I guess I have to say, a few decades ago. Not too long ago. Not too long. Uh, my, my training is in fishery science, um, and in, uh, a science which inherently uh, looks at human impacts. Uh, but the ocean sciences were studied primarily for the thrill of discovery, uh, to understand the, the natural phenomena of the ocean unspoiled by human impact. And those that did study human impact were viewed as doing less stellar science. Luckily, that's changed dramatically, and it's changed because everyone now recognizes that there's no place on Earth where you can go and actually study something that's not impacted by humans. Um, the other thing that's really different, I think, uh, m much of what was, uh, what, much of what funded ocean sciences post World War II, was the in was the Cold War, and the interest in understanding the oceans more deeply, uh, because it was important for uh, detection. Now we have a much more important societal relevance. We have a much more compelling reason why it's important to understand the oceans in all their uh, aspects. I'd also like to um, talk a little bit about the challenges that all of the uh, speakers are referred to. Um, <coughs> the oceans are immense, they're hostile, as many as the speakers all pointed out, they're very complex. Those sound like big challenges, but I think actually there's two other things that are even larger, one of which I think we can contend with. The first of these really grand challenges that we face in understanding the oceans is that, well, let me say first that I come from an experimental background. And in experiments, you have a control and you have measured changes in a few variables of interest. But what we are doing to the oceans and to our planet is um, what you would call the world's worst nightmare of an experiment, in which all variables are changing simultaneously, many of which are changing because of human impact, and there is no control. That makes it a huge challenge to unravel what actually is driving what. Um, even if you did it in a laboratory and had an experiment with no control and you changed all the variables, you'd have trouble figuring out what caused 
a particular change. In the ocean, it's an even bigger challenge, so that's huge. But luckily, we have tremendous new tools that we can use, uh, like observation systems, that enable us to at least separate time and space. They enable us, for the first time, to sample some areas of the ocean, not just for a, a few days at a time, producing a snapshot that confounds space and time, but we have the ability through observation systems to study the ocean continuously. Uh, and this is going to at least help us uh, resolve a big problem, which is the confounding of space and time. Uh, and I think uh, as the technology develops, we, those um, kinds of continuous observations from both um, cabled and, and fixed uh, observation systems and those uh, like profilers and gliders that Scott were talking about are really going to revolutionize our ability to understand the oceans. Uh, so uh, I think 100 years from now, my prediction is that when people look back at this era that we are in right now, they will refer to this as the golden age of ocean sciences because this is the period of time when we as a group of scientists have embraced the challenges, understand um, what's, what, what, what we are faced with and the fact that the science we are doing is absolutely essential to the sustainability of life on Earth. Thank so you, David. Thank that's you. My, that's my five minutes. I hope I didn't go over time. Very well used yeah. five minutes. Yeah. And, and I hope the audience are getting ready with their questions, and I hope we're stimulating some thoughts and ideas. I'm going to fly right back over the Atlantic again uh, to an Irish graduate from Trinity College, Professor Karen Wilcher, who is Vice Director of the Alpha Wagner Institute for Polar and Marine Research in Germany. Karen, your five minutes. Thank you very much. I'd like to take on the issue of how we communicate. In my view, with the prospect that in 100 years time, nearly all the world's population will be living at a coast, in other words, in direct contact with oceans and water, we need to increase our level of communication with regard to how our science is delivered and which science we delivered to the general population. Because it is perhaps the most important thing is that the population, or we as humans, all understand how important the ocean is to us. And that means that we have to deal with the different views, the different stakeholders, and these are everything from our energy suppliers, be it renewable energies or non-renewable energies, through to a person, for example, who lives behind a dike, or who doesn't, if they're unlucky enough maybe to live not behind a dike, and who might be at the mercy of the water coming down a river at the same time as the ocean inundation. Um, and in actual fact, I think the interesting thing is, although really most of the population does have contact with water and the oceans, they don't seem to understand how important they are to us. And maybe we as scientists have to wear the shoe, as one would say in Germany, and ask ourselves, are we communicating accurately our science to the policy makers? And then do the policy makers understand how important policy is <laughs> with regard to our oceans? And last but not least, I think we have to find new ways in total for communicating. And I think then, Scott, your initial statement, which says basically that you can start with poetry, um, which is one way of communicating, or a, or a film which we saw earlier on, that is certainly a way uh, to reach people, but there have to be other ways of reaching people because it's not obviously, quite obviously, not enough. And uh, I would like to, for example, take your example of a, of a, yeah, an organism, a big turtle, which is the cuddly number maybe for the population, and maybe then you can understand better how an ocean current can function. I think that's a very good example, and not just the disastrous aspect of. For example, I might, my house might be washed away in the Arctic um, if uh, we end up having um, more eroded coastlines or even the disaster. We, we tend to focus on disasters, in my view, in, or the pretty, the cushy number. We have to find something in between it. So at the end of the day, I think that the whole issue is how do we communicate that oceans are important? And maybe that's all I should say to that. Thank you, Karen. Now, Flying back to New England, 
Um, a man with the name of James McCarthy must have some Irish connection. What about that? <laughs> uh, a professor in Harvard University, a, a biological oceanographer, uh, a man who has been at the very head of what Euroscience o Ocean Forum is open forum, uh, is actually modeled on the AAAS system in the US. James, your five minutes. Thank you, Peter. Uh, well, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, these presentations. I hope you have as well. Uh, the topic, the Atlantic Summit, our shared resource, but uh, really we've been talking about the North Atlantic. North Atlantic is tiny, really tiny. Uh, the Pacific Ocean covers 40% of the globe. Uh, I personally, in my 40-some years of, of ocean research, have worked on all the oceans. So why all this focus on the North Atlantic? Well, it turns out it's really special. It's not simply because uh, we live on the shores of it and it's our, our front yard or backyard, but it really does behave differently from other areas. We've, we've had this wonderful introduction uh, to the longest river. So the Gulf Stream, I mean, every major, every ocean basin has a western boundary current. In the Pacific, there's the Kuroshio, uh, the North Pacific, the South Pacific, the East Australian current, the South Atlantic, the Brazil current, but none of them do what the Gulf Stream does, which is tuck deep and form that deep water that is, we've heard described in uh, presentations earlier today, is not only uh, extremely important to the climate of this area, because if that water weren't sinking, the Gulf Stream wouldn't be pulled north. The climate of Northern Europe and certainly of Scandinavia would be very different from, it is, from what it is today. So there's something really, really unusual about uh, the North Atlantic. And, and in part, it's explained by its connection to the Arctic. So the Pacific connects to the Arctic with a very shallow, broad shelf, but the North Atlantic connects the Arctic with deep water. And of course, the Arctic is an area that we also know is changing profoundly. There really hasn't been time today to talk about that, but, but as the Arctic goes, the North Atlantic will go. It, it's, it will change. Uh, we're now seeing right now, uh, in June, a new record low summer ice extent in the Arctic. Already in July, we've set new records. Uh, the, the, uh, the year of least minimum ice extent on record so far, uh, beginning with the satellite observations in 1980, was 2007. We're setting new records this year. And of course, that ecosystem will change. And as the ice goes away, uh, there will still be organisms. Uh, I hope some of you heard this morning the, the, uh, the Tara uh, project described, or maybe um, uh, the, the alien deep in the session before earlier uh, this afternoon in this room. Uh, no matter where you go on, on this planet, you will find organisms. So the Arctic will still have plankton, but there'll be different plankton. Uh, it'll still have fish, but there'll be different fish. Uh, many of the marine mammals and the seabirds uh, uh, may, may not be driven to extinction, but they'll be reduced to smaller areas. But the climate, the climate of this North Atlantic area will certainly change as sea ice is lost from the Arctic. So as we uh, look historically uh, to see how uh, climate has changed in this area. I mean, the Little Ice Age, um, well documented in, in literature and poetry and, and uh, painting, um, uh, paintings from, uh, from Europe. Uh, this is a, was a climate, uh, an uh, unusual period in climate that, that, as far as we know, wasn't seen profoundly other places. It was largely in the North Atlantic, the medieval warm period. So we know that this is an area that uh, can, over a relatively short period of time, uh, show large swings in climate. So it's another reason that we really uh, do uh, focus our, our interests and energies on uh, the North Atlantic. Um, I'd like to uh, just conclude by saying that um, in, my, uh, in my career in ocean science, uh, uh, so much has been learned, and we've had wonderful snapshots of that today, and I liked very much what David said about the whole perspective of ocean science Having, having shifted in the last few decades since the end of the Cold War. Uh, there's never been a more exciting time uh, with the technologies we have today, with the interdisciplinary connections, with the, the imperative to understand how the oceans are changing. And there's never been a more important time for the North Atlantic uh, to understand uh, how the North Atlantic is changing now is extremely important for the health and well-being not only in the North Atlantic, but for the societies on both sides of the North Atlantic and the world around that depend upon this ocean and its resources. Thank you. Thank you, James. And now our final uh, contributor, 
all the way from the University of Porto, uh, a dear friend of ours, Professor Isabel Sosa Pinto. Okay, thank you uh, for, for inviting me for this session. And um, I would like to support some of the things that were said before very shortly and perhaps raise two other points. And I, uh, I would like to support very much this notion that ocean literacy and promote ocean literacy is really important. Because even if I'm from a country like Portugal that we see each other very much connected to the sea, and historically we are very much connected to the sea and exploration and everything, what we found is, uh, what we find is that really we don't know that much more about the ocean, especially the ocean, uh, the marine environment. We don't know more than other nations that don't see themselves so much connected. And also our economy is not much more connected to the ocean. Of course, fisheries are going down. So really we need to interest people, not only to protect our oceans, but also in, in terms of using sustainably the, our oceans. And um, I think we, we should do that also by, well, many examples are given here. We, we have some, uh, for instance, my, my group has a program of bringing people to the beach, the children to the beach. And even this environment is so f should be so familiar. They are very surprised with what they find, find and what they learn there. So I think sometimes there are even simple things that we can do. Um, so I think the big challenge, and I'm very much, my, my, my research very much connected with biodiversity and, and, and the environment, but I think to protect biodiversity and the environment, both uh, marine and terrestrial, we, I believe we really need to use more the ocean and, and the resources we have in the ocean. And the challenge is doing this in a sustainable way. And for that, of course, we need to understand it better. I'm not going to say any more because we, 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 we learn about that a lot already today. But I think we need to also develop governance, um, governance of the oceans. And I think this was not very much mentioned. Uh, it's not really a research, but I think it's a development in a, in a field that is very important. It's law and that's maybe it's not very important for us as the researchers because we can do our research, we have mechanisms, but to, to, to actually, uh, for action, for protection is very important. And also when we want to use the, the, the sea, it's very important. And another point I'd like to make is about integration of activities. We already start seeing this a little bit. I work uh, for some time also in uh, integrated aquaculture, and I think this is very important to, uh, to make it more like an ecosystem, to make it more sustainable. But I believe also we should integrate other activities, new activities, and already plan them to be integrated, like for instance, this wind energy, that we are going to put platforms uh, at sea. And this, I mean, the sea is very, very big, but it's also difficult to, to use. And so if we have, if you're investing in something like platforms, we should try to make them um, compatible with other uses like aquaculture, even with tourism, with, without just looking at energy. And this is energy and that's the important thing. And really, um, then we use all the space with, with, with these devices and then we need aquaculture. And I, I think we need aquaculture at sea also. So I, I think, and this is something that we should really, and of course, collaborate um, in this kind of, of uh, research. And I think okay. I finish here. Thank you for that. Uh, and I want to thank the audience for being so attentive. The tur your opportunity has now come. We have at least three and maybe four volunteers who you can't miss because they're there in their lovely green t-shirts and they have a microphone. If you want to participate, please put your hand up. I'll try and spot you. Please identify yourself. And if you're posing a question, preferably, if you could identify to whom you want it posed. This gentleman here on the front right. Uh, right here in the second row on the front, on the right. My right, I beg your pardon. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tom Kennedy, editor of Science Spin, which is a science magazine. My question is not so much about who does the research, uh, that's the interesting bit, as uh, who funds it. And 
I, I noticed today in the presentations uh, that Moat is, is independent, that suggests it's privately funded. Um, I remember from previous uh, presentations, uh, some of the research being done in Portugal was funded by the military. Uh, then there was uh, the Tara, I think that has a private owner. Now, my, the reason why I ask this question is, we're all aware there's been a major shift in uh, policy, in, in funding policies uh, towards the applied and uh, we want results today that we can apply. Whereas a lot of marine research is, uh, would really fall into the, the blue skies uh, interest, uh, special interest, uh, long term type of uh, situation, which raises questions about how uh, difficult it will be to sustain a high level of funding. And what this leads me to wonder is, in America, in the States, there's a long tradition of private support for research. There are lots of foundations. In Europe, we have a a much poorer record in that respect. And not alone have we in the last number of years, when the, I remember when the first framework uh, programs began, uh, the emphasis was on the practical, the shipping. shipping it, it took a, a lot of work, thanks, uh, Geoffrey, <laughs> uh, to get Marine on the framework agenda. Uh, that was a major achievement. Uh, so the shift was towards a more general approach to, to funding marine research. But I'm just wondering, this is the question I'd like to throw out and something which I'd love to see debated is, what role, if any, could be uh, explored for uh, private participation, private funding, whether it be through tax relief mechanisms or otherwise, to uh, make up for some of the possible loss that we're going to get for Blue Skies research. Thank you. Okay, you do realise, Tom, that taxation policy is a member state responsibility. We haven't given it up to anybody yet. So I'm not, I'm not going to really point the finger too hard at Robert Jans. Robert, if you want to come in towards the table, if you want to move the mic, it'll be easier. Who wants to jump, jump in on that? The sustainability of funding, private versus public? Mike? Well, since my home institution was was mentioned specifically, I'll take an opportunity at this, and I, I, we are a bit unique in this respect, being 100% uh, independent. Um, as I said, it's about a $20 million a year operation. About half of that funding actually comes from competitive research grants from NSF, NOAA, um, just like a university uh, in, the, in the US. It's the other half that is a bit different and is worth explaining. Depending on a given year, anywhere from a third to a quarter of our science is funded through admissions to the public aquarium. Um, we translate and transfer the science that we're doing in the messaging in the aquarium, and that money is plowed back into the science. Um, again, the remaining third to 25 percent a year is, in fact, uh, from philanthropy. Um, we have uh, a fairly significant donor base uh, at Moat, uh, private foundations, individuals, um, that fund the research uh, that we do. Um, we don't have that straight line funding from uh, either a legislature at a state level or a federal level, a university kind of funding. That makes us very nimble, but it, it it really uh, creates challenges in terms of the funding as well. Um, but it is a combination of all of those uh, uh, different uh, avenues, as well as intellectual property. We have some of our research has led to patents that have now been licensed and are returning funds back to the research endeavor as well. Thank you. I think it's fair to say, it's an excellent question, Tom. In the US, through the National Science Foundation, uh, a very large commitment, a multi-annual commitment to ocean observation uh, to a cabled observatory capacity has, has commenced and has been built out at the moment. In Europe, Robert Jans has talked about an expansion of the Horizon 2020 program, the largest expanding area of the EU budget. And Blue Sky's basic research through the European Research Council uh, is strengthened. 
is enhanced and it has only come in in the last framework. I think in the Irish context, there has been a strong statement of prioritization. Yes, there's innovation, yes, there's applied, but there's a place for basic research. And I think you heard, we heard yesterday, uh, the Director General of Science Foundation Ireland committing to support uh, qualified pr projects that could get funding from the ERC, but the ERC's funding might not have stretched to. Um, I think also from a marine perspective, uh, we have a commissioner in Europe for research and innovation, who Robert Jans will know very well, comes from a coastal county. We have a Taoiseach who comes from a coastal county. We have a minister who comes from a coastal county. And we have a, a government who is about to initiate an ocean plan for Ireland. Um, I'm slightly optimistic. I think I'm practically, reasonably optimistic. Am I right in being optimistic, Robert Jans? Now, Peter, you can be uh, fully optimistic, um, <laughs> because indeed um, we are going to give a lot of priority to frontier research. Um, and blue sky research, I don't use the term because politicians don't like that word blue sky research. It says something which leads to nothing. So we talk frontier research is what we use to show that we are extending the borders of frontier. And uh, we are indeed reserving an enormous amount of money for that uh, also in the future. Um, and indeed the oceans, marine research is getting a special place as Peter knows uh, uh, quite well. Uh, that being said, I think there remains, and that was, I think, at the end of my, my, my presentation, my short presentation, a message I wanted to pass, there remains a very important responsibility also from the science of the researchers to really communicate to the public, but also to the policymakers. Uh, the policymakers should be getting the results of the research in such a way they can then indeed uh, base their legislation and their policy measures on the scientific facts and figures. And that is something which is very often is missing. A lot of data are available, a lot of research results, but they are scattered all over the place. And they are not allowing very often policymakers to do the thing which they are looking for, is indeed to develop the policies. So I think there is still an enormous amount of uh, work needed on communicating to policymakers, to the broad audience. And I think that's a responsibility from the research side. Certainly, if they would like to uh, obtain also in future money for frontier research. Thank you. This gentleman, you have the microphone now, sir. Thank yeah. you. If you could identify yourself. Yeah, I'm Ricardo Santos. I come from the University of the Azores. So I come from the, the, the <laughs> Central <laughs> Ocean. And in fact, in an archipelago, which two islands are in the American basin and <laughs> seven <laughs> islands in the Euro-African uh, Asian basin. And uh, 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 just to take a, an issue about uh, private funding in, in Europe. So it, it's not that much as United States, but I would like to call the, the remember the, 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 the role played by the, an American foundation, the Peter Sloan Foundation under the Sense of Marine Life, who got engaged in many projects. One of them is, uh, was Marico, just dedicated to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and it created a lot of synergies here in Europe and getting a lot of money for these procedures. And even in Portugal, we have a foundation called the Luso American Foundation, who has, is investing a lot in issues related with the oceans and uh, cooperation uh, uh, across uh, Europe and the United States on ocean issues. But the issue that I would like to, co to, to bring here, it's something that, in fact, my colleague Isabel uh, Sosa Pinto just recalled, it's about governance and what is being doing, do, done here in the northeastern Atlantic, and there has no parallel in the northwest Atlantic on marine protected areas, huge marine protected areas under the OSPAR Convention. And this involved several sectors. This Os Oslo-Paris Convention, which uh, all the, the, the countries of Europe, uh, Atlantic countries of Europe are members, and also the northeastern Atlantic Fisheries Council and uh, now more recently the CBD, the Convention of Biodiversity, Convention of uh, Biodiversity, CBD, Convention? Biological Diversity. Biological Diversity. Um, but this OSPAR Convention on the last, and this is the kind of, uh, every 10 years, the OSPAR Convention makes a, a, a synthesis about the Northeastern Atlantic that is under its governance. And uh, the last meeting was in 2010 in Bergen, and all ministers agreed, finally, on the declaration and the, 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 the declaration of creation of a set of seven 
marine protected areas in the high seas, mm -hmm. big marine protected areas, <coughs> part of the Charles Gibb fracture zone, very big, the Milne Sea Mounts, the Mar, the Mid Atlantic Ridge north of the Azores, something as uh, the size of 100,000 uh, 100, square kilometers, the Halte Sea Mount, the the Saddle Sea Mount, the Alt and the, the Josephine Sea Mount, but this divides the ocean. Nothing parallel exists on the Northwest Atlantic, and cooperation should be, in fact, uh, because the, there are no frontiers in the ocean. And uh, are you asking a question about that? And, and I would like also the I would like uh, ask the question: What is the view of these scientists about using marine protected areas on uh, a changing? Uh, world that we have uh, uh, to us uh, referred here today. Thank you. Mike, you used to be involved but in I also would like areas. to see more cooperation on these governance issues between the okay. two. I, I'll come back to a thing called the Atlantic Strategy and the Integrated Maritime Policy in Europe on that. We're in protected areas, Mike. Yeah, long ago in another life, yes, I was the chief scientist for all the marine sanctuaries in the U.S. <clears throat> and the Estuarine Research Reserves, and I couldn't agree with you anymore. There are no no boundaries in, in the oceans, and it's absolutely essential that um, marine protected areas, um, however you might want to define them, and there's a lot of different definitions for what constitutes a marine protected area, um, but that there is at least a linkage. A, and in the terrestrial uh, environment now, you're seeing a lot of these corridor principles for, for uh, conservation of, of biodiversity. In the marine environment, there needs to be that connectivity as well, and ensuring that um, species um, that have broad ranges are able to have uh, protected areas and habitats throughout that, that area. Whether it is um, the large marine protected areas or series of smaller ones that are networked together, as long as they achieve the, the end goal of uh, promoting the long-term uh, conservation and sustainable use of those resources. I think marine protected areas are an integral part of any ocean management, any ocean governance uh, scheme that might be uh, dreamed of. Thank you. I'm going to let another gentleman who's been waiting quite a while at the back there come in. If you could identify yourself and the question, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, also, thanks to the panel. This has been an outstanding uh, set of presentations. My name is Tim Persons. I'm the chief scientist of the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Um, and in the past uh, couple years, in response to some interest from the U.S. Congress, uh, we did a couple studies on the topic of uh, engineering the climate, or it's also known as geoengineering or climate engineering. Um, given the important uh, gaps, I guess, you, if you will, it's exciting science, it's big questions and so on, but we're pointed out in the ocean system the biological carbon pump, the thermohaline circulation, and so on. Um, I was just wondering the panel's opinion on uh, the viability, whether they thought that was a reasonable idea to pursue uh, engineering the climate systems, again, based upon uh, using the ocean or, or what have you, based upon all the concerns about global climate change. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to allow one very quick response to that, because I've just got the big rope to say uh, your time is up. We've got to vacate the stage. Who's going to take this one? <laughs> I think David answered that question best when he says we are doing a very uncontrolled experiment and that would be the same thing there are some very good ideas out there if there was a way to test some of those some of the best way to test those are with numerical models of what could happen in the future. Those numerical models take understanding, they take mathematicians, they take observations. We can't do it in the real world, so we have to somehow come up with those mathematical tests to do those in the future. And I think that's what will help guide us. And it's the best guidance we could help for uh, because this is an uncontrolled experiment we are already in and we've already begun. Thank you. I do apologize to the audience, anyone who wasn't able to get in. Uh, I want to leave a parting thought with you. We've heard from the experts how important the North Atlantic is. It's not a parochial view for us on either side of it. There's no point us being omnipresent and telepresent on one side of the Atlantic without being there on the other. We need to be there in the middle. We need to be doing it together. Let's do it together. Thank you. <laughs>